the Bolians are maintaining an uneasy truce with the Maropa. Mazarians value peace above confrontation. And Captain Picard visited Chalna 12 years ago while commanding the Stargazer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we're doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation Season 3, Episode 18, Allegiance, written by Richard Manning and Hans Beimler, directed by Weinrich Colby. This was March 24th, 1990. Where were you? I know where our very special guest was. He was right there making all the makeup and awesome aliens and being recognized by his peers for it. Everybody, we have a very special guest today. It's Mr. Michael Westmore. How are you, Michael? I'm good. How's everybody there? So good. The legend himself. So great to have you. We've got all yes. kinds of aliens. Let's just get into it. First things first, Michael, when you read this script, did it have specific aliens with which to work? Or did they just say, and eh, Michael's department works some magic and we'll figure it out later? It's the second one. <laughs> <laughs> I never actually, uh, in my 18 years there, uh, the scripts never described what the alien was going to look like. They would hmm. just say alien, and it was up to me to figure it out. Really? Um, that's, I, I, I had a lot of questions about this, because this is a heavy makeup episode. There's a lot of aliens in this episode. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a lot of Klingons, but I, I assume it's easier to do makeup if you have the same, if they're all Klingons and you have a bunch 20 Klingons as opposed to five different styles of aliens. Is that is that correct? Oh, yeah, sure. It's uh, when you're cookie cutting, <laughs> doing uh, multitudes, like, like the Jemadar and then the Cardassians and things, uh, because so many times, you know, one piece fits all. And so uh, you only have to make a few to maybe maybe adjust to somebody else. But in this instance, uh, everybody in this uh, one w was never repeated. It was all, yeah, yeah there, were, there was a number of shows where it just, we come up with those. But the moles, I always saved in case for some reason they, you know, they bring them back. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Michael, it's a, a little known fact that Bolians are possibly my favorite Star Trek alien. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why. They're, we don't see them terribly often, but we do sometimes with Captain Ricks, with uh, this lady here. Also, we see uh, Mr. Mott later on, the barber, mm -hmm. maybe one or two others. I think there was a Bolian on Deep Space Nine who was like a like at the helm of the Defiant or something yeah, like that. Would, we would pop them in when met so many times when we had, you know, groups of them that they called and they'd say, you know, give us three Westmore aliens, which meant <laughs> dig out of the box and find whatever. And if we had somebody that we had the time to uh, put a bald cap on or whatever, you'd find a Bolian in the background too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this particular uh, Bolian, I, I do believe this is one of the very first episodes of Star Trek I'd ever seen in my life one of the first few because i remember getting kind of fascinated by these aliens this particular bolian is the only one i've ever seen with hair was there yeah. any kind of discussion about that did it just kind of happen you know there, no there, there's no there's actually no <laughs> discussing it uh well i mean as far as you know going to the producer and saying what i wanted to do um this was almost like an nd alien and it wasn't intentionally made to be a bolian because all the bolians are bald and have watermelon stripes across the top of their head mm -hmm. and they're a much richer blue why this one was basically i want to say almost like a, a made-up one out of a box you know like grabbing uh facial uh slits out of a, the bolian box and really we hadn't done that many so i never knew if they're ever going to return or not and uh, the hairdresser just to, I kind of give this one a disguise, put a, a wig on this person, and we uh, uh, g glued down the center part of her hair and stuck another little piece in there. But had it been really a true boilian, uh, there would have been watermelon stripes across mm -hmm. the top 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, I thought, well, maybe this is a cousin from a far distant planet. And uh, they're not bullies. (laughs) They're, you know, Mr. Mott backwards. They're Toms or something. (laughs) Anyways, it's... uh, (laughs) You know, if you want to think it's a Bolian, you can. But it's uh, it was not on purpose. Did you keep all of those Bolian parts in the Bolian alley? Oh gosh. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Ooh, I like. Well, you know, it took me a minute to catch on, but I got it. <laughs> yeah, it was very good. Oh yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you because I'm also in, uh, curious about the Bolian because my eyes couldn't really get off of it. And one of the things I was thinking about was also the hair application on top of the the makeup and so i was wondering is that a the bald caps put on you put the prosthetic and then add hair on top of that no no this is probably a wig the that i think josie or joy was the hairstylist then and uh it, we just took a wig and you know glued down the the yep. hair on both sides and then put the appliance in there and uh, and made it up um, mm-hmm. But also, as far as I, and I said, color wise, the, the uh, all the Boleans, the bald Boleans you see throughout it, including the females along the way, uh, mm-hmm. were all a much brighter blue. Yeah. You know, not to talk that, too much about the Bolian but, and the Bolian hair, but I noticed maybe because this is more HD than I remember when I first saw it. But I thought whoever did the hair on the bully and did a really good job of blending the blue into like highlights, because that seems like a really difficult thing to do is to, I'm assuming, spray yeah. blue on there and not make it look splotchy or all one color, but more just kind of like bluish highlights. Can you yeah, tell us a that, bit about that? And this was this was pre uh, make pre the makeup artist using airbrush. So this was all done by hand. Mm. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Um, I, I I know I'm gonna. I got more bully in, but <laughs> <laughs> more bully in. Um, so the split that's caused in the middle of the face. Can you just like give me an idea of how that is that how that's done? That's a prosthetic that's going down the it's, middle of their yeah, face. It's it's a prosthetic that literally has a split down the uh, the center. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. And in this particular case, I could see it underneath the wig, which made it look, uh, you know, made my eye gravitate towards that split underneath the wig. But uh, yeah. so this is just this is this is the the actor's face with just the prosthetic down the middle. Right. Right. The mm-hmm. pieces are about an inch wide. OK. Oh, wow. OK. Yeah. And then, of course, on the real bullions, the, the piece that went from the uh, I, I would say the bridge of the nose all the way across the top of the head on top of the bald cap that piece was uh, about 14 inches mm-hmm. okay um and, no go ahead i i i'm okay. gonna yeah i, I have gonna other say, other alien questions <laughs> me too exactly okay. the chalna <laughs> Uh, I think this is the only time we see that alien. I'm not 100% certain, but I think it is. You're and, 100% right. <laughs> oh, really? It is the only time with those yeah. four teeth. He kind of reminds me of an alien I really liked in Gambit Parts 1 and 2 named Baran. He kind of mm-hmm. had like a lion look in the seventh mm-hmm. season. But this is definitely their own alien, the Chalnun. His name was Esok. So this was the only time we've ever seen this. Did you use what? What were the pieces? Were they pieces from other aliens? No, no. Or no, okay. these were all took a cast of his face and uh, sculpted the pieces you have here. And then I made uh, uh, you know his teeth for him. So it was a fresh set of teeth, and there's four of them, like fangs that go up from his lower teeth. And the uh, this was a German actor. And he really oh. did well. And the, and the colored contact lenses when you come in close yeah. up and everything. Uh, again, none of these, you know, this was, I think, one of those scripts where we didn't have a lot of time. So we're just we're going quick. And it was like the, the, this whole makeup would have been applied makeup and hair in probably about three hours uh, or less. 
And uh, it just, he, I mean, he loved getting into the makeup. So it wasn't <laughs> like you're dealing with a, you know, a drama queen or anything. And uh, he, he loved getting into the makeup because he, he became the character. It was, it was a fun one. And of course, you know, when you do a makeup like this, and it was a number of times during the filming over the 18 years that I was always hoping they would bring something back because I did save every mold from every alien, which uh, wow. we finally dumped everything. No, we didn't dump everything. Some of it was sent to Germany. Uh, but uh, it was just, it was fun putting makeups together like this. Um, so like Ryan, I actually was reminded of an alien as well from this the Jachalna, um, but I thought of the. Are they called Tellerites, Ryan? The, oh, uh, the Jenkin Paul. The Tellerites, yeah, the pink ones. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They were. You know, I I based them on the original ones from the original series, but tried to make them <laughs> so yeah. the actors could at least see. Those were just kind of like rubber masks that they chopped up to do that with, and the actors couldn't see well. So <laughs> you notice they're always looking up. Uh, trying to see somebody, it's because hmm. they couldn't see, you know, with, <laughs> through those eyes. But uh, yeah, the uh, my uh, tell tellerites are, um, you know, based as I said, based on the original series, but kind of like just brought up to modern day, so they could really use their hands and uh, yeah, because they it was a, a their thumb was a a part of a hoof, yeah, so they. They they could use their hands. They could eat lunch, and they didn't do things. So, uh, you know, again, a, yeah. A, a final comment on uh, that Chalna alien Esok was the first thing I noticed when he first pops up is there's kind of a close up, and you can see his teeth, and you can see them coming out, and you can actually see under his lip, and it looked meaty. It didn't look like a a piece of plastic in there it looked like there was i'm like how did they like how well, did yeah. what what i had to do was paint him and you'd know if had i just left the pink there the, the teeth are actually set they're they're made out of acrylic mm -hmm. and his gums from a cast of his own teeth i made the gums that the, the teeth would fit in and in, in doing that uh, I, going back a little bit taking it the man that taught me to do to make teeth uh, was John Chambers, the man that won the Oscar for Planet of the Apes. I was his mm -hmm. first apprentice, and he was a dental technician before he became a makeup artist. And this is one of the things I learned as an apprentice back in the 60s. And so when you're painting the gums, you just don't leave them pink. It's like you go in between the teeth and you put a little red and you can take a little bit of the thinner on it and smear it around a little bit. And then when it's all done, there's a clear acrylic that you paint over the whole thing. And when the saliva gets going in the mouth and everything, uh, they do. They look it absolutely real. worked That's for like me. Every Klingon. I did this with every pair of Klingon teeth, which I can't even begin to tell you how many I made of those. <laughs> uh, but uh, everything. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was impressed by that. I, I do my drawings, as you know. And this is this was my uh, Tellerite uh, slash Chink uh -huh. Chalna, Chalna drawing right here. Uh huh. Uh, and then there's my other. This is the last alien which I had questions about here, and that was the um, <clears throat> the Miser was it the Miserian? Yeah, it was Miserians. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so this question was about the integration of the costume and the makeup, Michael. Uh -huh. Um, that particular alien is wearing this hooded kind of headdress, right? And, and I was I was wondering if that was done to hide any anything, or was it designed that way initially? No, yeah, we could have put a bald cap on him or uh, anything. Uh, I think that's what uh, Bob Blackman was the costumer then, and Bob and I worked very close. I mean, he he would tell me when he was going to do something that if a uh, a, a Ferengi female was going to have a low cut dress or something, and that, which meant, you know, painting her orange further down. Uh, but in this instance, um, he was one for some part of the character or something. This is what he designed as the costume for it. So if he comes and he tells me that, I don't have to, you know, 
cover his ears or put his head. His head probably came up, I think it did, you know, high enough that it covered his, his hairline. So mm-hmm. we were dealing with just a face in there. And, of course, then the wardrobe kind of takes and puts two-way tape along the inside of the costume. And then they'll stick it right to the face. So that's – I, I more or less recollect that this is, you know, what we did. Yeah, and I, I really like the that particular headdress and that design because from the profile, it actually has a – ridged kind of design to it. It reminded me of the Sydney Opera House. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I thought, how totally. creative how creative is that for a, you know, like a hood, a hoodie? Yeah. And again, this is a character that never came back. Yeah, and this was, this was like, a, th- this is one of those, like, uh, you just decide like, Hey, this will be more of a reptile. Cause this, cause I, I instantly felt like, Oh, this is a reptilian type of alien. You know, it, it could be, I think that the main, the whole main thing was, is all the ridges that just came down the face and just not little, little stripes, but you know, larger, uh, kind of ripples. Yeah. And, and the color was another question I had because, the color of the skin was very close to the hood, to the yes. clothing, and yeah. I, I was I was wondering if that was just a coincidence or that just you know something you guys worked out together. You know, like very possibly it could be a coincidence where I decided in balancing the colors out, and it was, you know, he could have been painted yellow with, you know, red stripes yeah. or something, but it was just this was just more subtle. And the character itself was just a very kind of subtle character. But uh, I don't remember if Bob and I ever talked about, you know, like giving me a sample of the hood or not. I think we just did that. And that happened to be what he had in mind. Because wow. <laughs> I didn't care, you know, what color costume he put on him. That's the color of the face I was going to go with. But it worked out really well. Accidents yeah. happen, or, you know, even for the best. Speaking of which... A happy accident was today. I was at a function, as you know, uh, and you know who I ran into was actually um, one of these guys. Literally today, the two brothers, Jeff the Rector. Two, yeah, right. I, that, this looks like Jeff Rector, so this yep, must be Jerry twins. Rector. And it's so funny because I saw him. I was like, dude. I've literally just watched your episode and we're going to be talking about it with Michael Westmore later today. I did not realize they were brothers until the, you know, kind of the opening scenes. It shows Jeff Rector and Jerry Rector in the credits. Uh, what can you tell us about this? Cool. This was a nameless alien race, if I remember correctly, right? You're right. I don't think they gave him a name. And luckily enough, they both had about the same size head. So I only had to literally make two rubber heads and it's one size fits all. <laughs> at least in their family. And I have run into both the guys over the years. And it's like, they always come up to me if we, if we see each other. And, really? And yeah. And it, but it's like being twins and doing this, it was, you know, it was very interesting. But, yeah, uh, I mean, I, it, this is a full head makeup. Yes. This seems like it's, seems like it's even more work. And, well, I, did, I, I had a little bit of time. They, ca- they cast them. I think before everybody else. And so I was able to make a full plaster head cast of one of them, which I don't remember, and then sculpt it on that one head. And then you make the big mold and it takes time to uh, to ma- actually make the rubber on this. Uh, it, it would take a, a couple of bowls of big rubber to fill it. And then it would have to bake in the oven for, mm. I don't know, normally everything was about three hours. This may have taken about four hours because there was a lot of rubber in the top of the head and around the back of the head. But uh, the two guys had fun with it. So it was, uh, and they're so nice too, to, you know, willing to do anything. And the, the, I made larger nostrils on there because when I finally was doing the clay sculpting, it just seemed like the character called for bigger sculptures. But I don't remember 
what the inspiration was for this? Because I, I look at yeah, it. Yeah, that's what that was my question. <laughs> like, what what, what did you get from that? Yeah, maybe where is a, that? You know, maybe it's a bug, you know. Yeah. I, I I was trying to figure out what is the inspiration of it too. I mean, our <clears throat> With, without me, you know, in very uh, respectable way as possible. Are these guys big headed brothers or no. is the head that I'm seeing no, um, they're very exaggerated? Big. No, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, they're just the further in height, which isn't, you know, I don't know, maybe five, eight, five, nine or something. Mm -hmm. It's just a normal yeah. size head. So the whole idea was not to stay with a normal size head, to do, okay. uh, to, to more or less, I want to say, start to spread it out it's yeah. like you're doing a mushroom you know uh so it's uh i i kept looking and i think as i was doing it it's like i started putting clay on and it started i wanted to get it bigger and bigger and it's like okay the cheekbones around here the frontal bones on the forehead what are we going to do across here i just didn't want to make a big round bald head so it's more or less I, I, I don't know if I can even find an animal uh, or a species of anything on earth that looks yeah. like this. I, so I'm saying a bug, there's probably a bug somewhere that has these features. Yeah. Uh, kind of like almost like a beetle yeah. kind of head yeah, or a, yeah. maybe a little bit if of a you, shape of like a predator. Kind of, kind of, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Which so they came back, maybe I'd do that. By the way, you were thinking, nominated. Yeah. You were nominated for an <laughs> Emmy for this episode, right? Oh, hold that up, Sirach. Oh, yeah. yeah, that is my my big head. There it is. Yeah, yeah. Drawing guy. Yeah. <laughs> so well, that was it. it was, the idea was to take it away from a human shape. Mm -hmm. I felt it. I felt it. Yeah. Yeah, so like but I was saying... you've been nominated uh, a million times, so, right? I mean, right? Right. right? Is that, I mean, Mr. No, only 42, been, not a million. Only, yeah, only 42 times. <laughs> and counting. But I mean, this is definitely one of those episodes yeah. that stands out because not only is it a multitude of aliens, but it's different aliens. And many of them we're seeing for the first time. In fact, all of them we're seeing for the first time, except the Bolian. Yeah. But this is the first time we're seeing a Bolian like this. So it's really a bunch of new and different alien races that are all acting differently that look very different, different sizes, different colors and shapes, big hair, you know, the the Sydney uh, opera house thing, head piece. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's why you were so uh, decorated, you know, for the, your many episodes, but especially this one is just because the of variety. Yeah. It's just so many different kinds, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's variety. Also, um, I think the best makeup was the other Picard because he looked just like the real Picard. <laughs> that was it also was Jeff Rector. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great makeup. <laughs> you know, there was what the uh I forgot which movie was it where I had to the English actor uh who was Picard as a young man and I literally I made a nose because his nose was nothing like Patrick's and teeth. I did upper and lower casts of Patrick's teeth. Oh. And then made Patrick, literally, a set of Patrick's teeth for him to fit in while he was in the in, in character. That's unbelievable. I did not know that. Yeah. That was, uh, was it in Rascals? No, it was a, a feature. Oh, okay. So it was Generations, maybe. I think it was after generations. Uh, with, oh, oh, uh, oh, oh! You mean um, Tom Hardy Tom in Hardy. Nemesis? Yes, got it. I, who I, played his Tom clone? Hardy. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. He had to have a similar look to Patrick because he also, sh you know, shaved his head and put. Uh, so this was just an addition because Patrick's nose was so different. It, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm I've been used to doing all. I used to make noses for Michael Jackson so he could get out of the house without the paparazzi really wow, that's a throw that's a throwaway <laughs> gem right there yeah i know like we should have started yeah. with that that, 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 that was deserves you. a follow-up question yeah. yeah um yeah that was you <laughs> um that's pretty cool mm -hmm. 
I mean, among the other things that you've done in your life, I mean, it doesn't surprise me, obviously, but it's, it does kind of surprise me. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I did want to ask you, um, you mentioned destroying a lot of the uh, mold that you had over the years. Yeah. And then you said some of them went to Germany. Uh, wh- yeah. What did you, what did you mean by that? Like, uh, is there a museum um, there or? Well, so- some of the, I mean, a lot of the molds were maybe were old or something. We got rid of those. Uh, there was a man that actually paid uh, Paramount uh, for the molds. And he had a giant car. He was going to open a Star Trek museum and maybe start making these molds uh, again, recreating them. And it, it's never happened. But that uh, he came and he picked all these up, uh, you know, 20, 20 years, 2005 or six is when we closed up the, the the mold room let's and, find uh, that guy so they're just sitting there right, <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. nothing's ever been done with them wow that i know well michael uh we're just about yeah. out of time here but we do want to tell you how unbelievable it is every time you join our show we're so thrilled and honored yeah. Every time you come in here and you tell us stories about, oh, by the way, I used to work for Michael Jackson. No big deal. But anyway, <laughs> about this, uh, <laughs> just gonna throw yeah. it out there. You're a living legend, and I just want to say thank you so much for hanging out with us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. You. I enjoyed it all the time. So uh, you come so up lucky. with good questions. <laughs> well, you give us so much, so much gems, so many gems that we can chew on and. You know, the, the work speaks for itself. It's so, even after all of these years, it's still impressive when you see it. It's still emotionally impactful when it's on screen. There's, there's, there are feelings that I get uh, attached to the different alien faces. Um, for example, the hoodie guy, I just didn't trust him, you know, it's, it's just something, <laughs> you know, I just, just off of just off sight, you know, without yeah. even him saying anything. So there's, the emotional attachment is there. So I guess when you read these characters, you're able to take whatever uh, emotions that are prescribed to them in the script and yes. really bring that to life with the, with the makeup, because like, you know, with the, with the, sh- the teeth and everything, I felt, I felt vi- uh, violence. I felt, you know, intimidated. I felt a, a sense of fear and urgency when he arrived. So um, kudos to you for taking the words on a paper and 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 bringing to life those those characters that evoke those kinds of emotional reactions. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, it's with the um, with the characters too. I mean, once they get in these these rubber faces, they have to bring them to life, uh, bring uh, bring them to life. And uh, I learned this many years ago when I was doing a television series uh, called Eleanor and Franklin, and uh, Jane Alexander was doing a makeup and hair test and she's just standing there and she's not moving and i could see everybody kind of getting nervous about the makeup so i went up and i whispered in her ear you know open your mouth talk move around put your hand up to your face rub your nose just this thing isn't going to fall off so she did all this and everybody goes oh so (laughs) every star trek alien in character that we had in makeup i gave them the mirror test so they could see you know, that this is really, you're an alien. You're not a person wearing a mask. Hmm. So good. That's why we've seen images of Quark doing this with his nose and all that kind of stuff that it it shows. There, yeah. there are people that were able to kind of mess around with it, not worry about it. It's not going to fall off. It's not going to wrinkle. It's, yeah. uh, they're going swimming in it, wrestling. It <laughs> it's part of your face now. Yeah. So, yeah. And then with the contacts and everything, I mean, just the whole, the total look and the, the packages there, um, you know, it just, the, t- the touches are all there. And, you know, that's, uh, that's what I always looked for. It was, it wasn't just putting a face on them. They could have freckles. They could have a scar. Klingons had mm-hmm. scars, you know, just to bring other things uh, to life. To life. Yeah. In, you mentioned in, the, bull, the bullion watermelon stripes and, and we see it, the freckles that you put in in certain places. It, it, it makes it, it makes the skin look alive, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. gives it texture. Uh, yeah. Texture, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, oh, my Mr. Pleasure Westmore. You guys. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Just the best. My pleasure. Uh, everybody stick around. We will have much more coverage. We'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back 
to the seventh rule with Ciroc, the final boss, Lofton. <laughs> Hello. All right. Here are the trivioids of the week. Man, I I'm feel just feel so fortunate that Michael Westmore comes and tells us his stories. And is so he, gracious. A, <laughs> yeah. What a blessing. Hey, re- yeah. To be able to just pick his brain on stuff. And I mean, I can barely remember what I did last yesterday. <laughs> I know. That's the thing is he remembers such, he'll be like, and this guy was here two days and we did, I'm like, how unbelievable. Like, you know, they're, they're five, eight, I think five, eight. I'm like, oh, you got the height down, you know, exactly. Genius. Guy, he's just the one you want uh, testifying when he's in, a, in a lineup. He's the mm-hmm. guy who would trust his memory. <laughs> Love that, man. So here are the yeah. trivioids. <clears throat> the Enterprise crew has finally succeeded in eradicating the Firox plague on Cor Karali 5. I think that's what it was. Uh, the Enterprise yeah. is set to rendezvous with the USS Hood. That's an interesting one. To assist in their terraforming efforts on Browder 4. Cadet Mitena, Mitena Haro studied Captain Picard's mission at Starfleet Academy, or did she? Picard takes a bite out of something edible that looks kind of like soap. The nearest pulsar is in the Lanka cluster. Captain Picard is tapping out the first six prime numbers. The Bolians are maintaining an uneasy truce with the Maropa. In the last 300 years of Mazarian history, their planet has been conquered six times. <laughs> The Mazarians value peace above confrontation. Captain Picard visited Chalna 12 years ago while commanding the Stargazer, and the Enterprise's engine efficiency is at 93%, but that's not good enough, damn it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, USS Hood. I believe, and everybody in the comments below, correct me if I'm wrong, and I think we'll find this out in a, in a future episode of Next Generation, maybe season five or six or something, seven. Um, the USS Hood is where Riker used to be a commander or lieutenant. But he he came from the USS Hood and his captain, I believe, was Captain DeSoto. I think Riker was a lieutenant or lieutenant commander under Captain DeSoto before he transferred over to the Enterprise to become first officer and commander. Anyway, that's what I think. I think I remember that when I read that years ago. So, Ciroc, all, all I read kind of was a... that. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no I'm, I was just going to say, I, I just read that a lot of the black Starfleet officers came from the hood. <laughs> I had to throw that in. It was the hood. It's, I got to get me a, a, are those a the USS big... hood hoodie. <laughs> right. Were those the big head brothers you were asking about earlier? <laughs> <laughs> no, those are different, different like, set. Were those some big headed brothers? And I was like, what? <laughs> You're like I said, giant heads, man. It was crazy. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, the USS Hood. As soon as I heard that, I was like, that, "That's that's where I got. I need a USS Hood hat or something. That's pretty cool. <laughs> that would be cool. Yeah, straight from the hood, man. That's where you transfer. Yeah, from. exactly. So, what do you think of this episode? Because I remember this one. Again, it was one of the first ones I'd ever seen. Um, and. I, I remember liking it. I remember just liking the different aliens. I remember liking the crew kind of sussing out that that fake Picard was looking like he was just trying to test them and, and keep them busy, keep them, you know, just like he was just messing with them. Um, I didn't remember Beverly sitting down next to him and being like, hey, at the end there, that was kind of yeah. funny. But I'm, I don't know. What did you think? Did you enjoy it? Um, I was curious to find out what the hell was going on in the beginning. So that my curiosity was about, I would say halfway through the episode, I was like, well, what's this going to, what's this about? What's going on? It, it waned a little bit when I didn't see enough there to kind of, um, quench the thirst of my curiosity. It was, it was very on the surface what it was appearing to be, but. I, I didn't understand the purpose of this other captain, mm-hmm. what what that person was probing for, or, or the distraction wasn't, I don't even know if it was necessary. The whole flirtation with uh, with 
Crusher, I was like, I wrote down in my notes, I said, this is when Jack Crusher was, uh, I think this, this version of Picard might be Jack Crusher's father. Uh, <laughs> for all we know. Because <laughs> it, it looks like he got closer. He got somewhere. Closer, he got closer to, to Beverly than he's, he has so far, except for that little cave scene that they had. It was weird. She said, I like our relationship just the way it is. He's like, do you want to dance? And she's like, all right. Let's let's be more than friends. She's like, well, yeah. I mean, if you're gonna dance, then what am I supposed to do? <laughs> of course. Yeah, it was it was. I, I don't know that that was a little bit strange to me, and I the fact that nobody picked up on it was the the that was what was bothering me the most because I was like, Troy, you got one job, you got one job on this show, and that is to 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 feel out what what people are thinking and feeling and to tell us, you know, to be like the lie detector test. And she couldn't sniff the lie out in this particular episode, which kind of bothered me because he was able to, you know, tell her, Hey, let me know if anybody's asking, acting strange. She should have instantly picked up on that for me in the beginning. Like, what do you mean? You never told me that before. Like, do you have a reason to suspect that people would be acting straight? Like a little follow up, like, there wasn't enough pushback for me. Uh, everybody was just accepting him acting a little bit straight. Like he he invites her to dinner. He's wearing a robe. I know. Like a little... <laughs> I was like, I was just looking at this nineteen nineties fashion. Like he kind of—I'll be honest though—he kind of looked sexy, man. I was like, he looked like sultry. You know, like it he looked was ready sexy, to like... but it looked like it looked Hugh Hefner sexy though. Like like I blushed little... when he looked at the camera. I went. <laughs> <laughs> and then Beverly had her 1990, you know, like ruffled shoulder thing going on. I was like, what is going on here? And why is it so hot? Yeah, I get it was hot. I thought he was going to disrobe for a second and say, do you want to dance? It was it was almost horizontally. <laughs> and then like nobody picks up on it. Like uh, he sets course for somewhere where they're not headed for. There's, they have a rendezvous with the hood. They're not going to meet with them. They're going to go to some distance somewhere else for some non-explained reason. Uh, and nobody even just like, hey, why are we going over there, Captain? Well, you know, Starfleet said we got to meet with the hood. You know, I mean, there was no pushback and not enough for me. Um, and so the the people not pushing back very blatant. Like I would expect the doctor. Dr. Crusher, of all people, because she was, he played to her wantingness to have a relationship, right? There's this underlying, you know, curiosity between the two of them. And that's what this pretend Picard uh, played to. He also d played to other things, which I thought were good signs of his character. Like when he would say, hey, good job, guys, you know, and hey, let's have a drink and a toast to this. Yeah. Like, hey, he, he he does need to do a little. Let's bit more keep of that. fake Picard. We like <laughs> fake Picard better. He's kind of messing with the crew, but then he compliments <laughs> them and says they're doing. He keeps things lively. <laughs> keeps them guessing, you know. Yes, fake yes. Picard. They're like fake Picard, fake Picard, <laughs> clinging drinks. They're like, we love you, fake Picard. Yes, I will say though, when you were talking about you know getting the you know with with Beverly, you know, and how she's a doctor. I just realized that's a really strange way to ask her out because if he's getting a full physical exam at his age, that's going to include some things that she's going to have to do to him to give him a full yeah. physical. And then for him to just turn back around and be like, so anyway, uh, you know, yeah. and, or, and she's like, why did you come get a physical if you feel fine? <laughs> like if it, he's, just, he's like coming in for a routine physical ahead of time yes. and then she's performing the physical and he's like so anyway how about dinner my place that i just realized this, yeah. it feels very peculiar that, and, and nobody picked up on it that wharf i thought was about to pick up on it there was a moment where he kind of does this like you know look on his inquisitive mm -hmm. kind of yeah eyebrow kind of scruff like hmm? but he doesn't follow up uh Riker kind of fits, but doesn't follow up you know and it's, it's like you guys know this guy 
you hang out with him all the time. Um, either he's doing some drugs, <laughs> something <laughs> like he's got to be, he's on something, man. You got to figure it out because he's not acting right. You know, the uh, whole singing scene, the whole dancing, those are that all was things that we don't see him do. Egregious. Yeah. That was the, the most obvious thing where they're like, okay, we love fake Picard, but it's obviously a fake Picard. But yeah, I think maybe Worf didn't say something because if you'll notice, Worf is always wrong in these episodes. Every time Worf says something, Picard's like, no, all right, Mr. Worf, will you stand down? You know, it's stuff like that. So this time he's like, going to say something. He's like, I better not. They're just always going to yell at me. And he would have been right. Finally, he would have been right. It would have been perfect <laughs> for him to, to actually get shot down just so he could say, I told you so. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, th- th- those were some of the things that, um, I mean, the makeup was so amazing. That was just really like, uh, it was just phenomenal. So I, and I did think, I swear, I thought it was a, a Tellarite. I, I, I was totally off on that, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, the makeup was great. The, I don't know. It was just there were just moments for me that just didn't that they should have picked up earlier. And Troy, like Troy, doesn't have a, a sense for that. I know that was me too. I was like, well, she can't say there's something different about this Picard, or or couldn't Riker ask Troy, hey, we're literally talking about potential mutiny. Before we take this any further, hey, Deanna Troy, are you sensing anything? What's going on? What, you know, like that's the biggest deciding factor is what does the psychic lady say? <laughs> What's yeah. up? And she's like, well, if yeah. nobody's going to ask me, I'm not going to tell you. So, yeah, whatever. Good luck guessing. <laughs> yeah. I just, I'm sorry. I, that bothered me. The other thing bothered me was, they were like, um, he says, oh, recalibrate uh, a new flight path. We're going to that star over there. Mm-hmm. And they're like, okay, sure. How fast we should go? He's like, warp point zero zero three. Like, <laughs> it'll take us it'll take us six weeks to get there. And everybody's like, cool, let's play cards then. Like, yeah. they're like, hey, well, we can use the extra time to do nothing. What speed? Warp, take our sweet ass time speed, <laughs> point one, engage. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, that to me were like, those were the big obvious tells for me that I felt there should have been somebody, somebody should have been saying, hey, I don't, I don't feel like, it, you know, at least been asking around if, if, if Dr. Crusher, am I crazy? Or even if Troy's like, I'm telling you guys, I don't think this is Picard. And they're like, get out of here. What are you talking about, Deanna? You need to relax. Play some <laughs> cars. What do you got, a flush? <laughs> I do have to flush, she says. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's, uh, we're just about out of time here. But let's talk about some people that would have never laughed at that dumb flush joke. But we love them <laughs> to death. Their names are, oh, so sorry. What about the home run of the day? Let's not forget the home run of the day. <laughs> home run of the day is going to go to Michael Westmore. It was the makeup that was the home run in this episode. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the story was okay. It was a little slow in certain parts, but for sure the makeup was just uh, home run material. Yeah, totally agree. Except I love this episode. Maybe it's just because it's one of the first ones I've seen. Or the cool alien. <laughs> I actually love this episode. Not not the best, but it's a, yeah. it's a very enjoyable episode for me. Definitely Michael Westmore hits the home run. All these aliens yeah. are new. They're different. They're fun. They're interesting. And they, they're beautiful. And they hold up on HD. You know, once you, you, <laughs> you, you lean in for it on HD, like a lot of things don't always hold up. But these definitely do. And uh, yeah. his, his work on these episodes is amazing. Speaking of amazing, yeah. here they are. Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, T.J. Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Titus hey. Muller, Dr. Muhammad Noor, <laughs> Tierney C. Diekman, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, my live from Tokyo, the Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manisfi, Greg K. Wickstrom, Jed Thompson, Dr. Susan V. Gruner, Glenn Iverson, Dave Gregory, Tim Baum, Chris Sternett, Christopher D. Marshall, 
Joanna Yunker, Roy uh-huh. Epen, and of course, Jason Oaken. Everybody stick around. We've got the free for all up next, and we will be right back on the seventh rule. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule with Sarah. Well, Sarah's going to hop back on in a second, yeah. everybody. <laughs> Probably. Uh, look who else is here, though. It's Melissa Longo. Hi. I brought friends. <laughs> uh, we were just talking about friends. Uh, Jason M. Oaken is also here with a cool background, as always. Faith Howell, what's up? Uh, Allison Leach, hi. Looks like she's got her cool Uhura shirt from Melissa's store. Uh, the Introverted Republic, you can get it there. Chris McGee's got a cool seventh rule. Uh, you know, it's kind of a play on Appetite for Destruction. You can get that shirt at our Teespring store. My is live in Tokyo with Data and forgot her name. Helena, something like the Bolian. <laughs> Dr. Muhammad Noor is in a sea of blue. And Carrie Schwent you- is showing off yellow today. All right, everybody. Everybody guesses the IMDb score. (laughs) Seven, nine? Six, two. I was going to get seven, seven. Kyle says it's a 10. I'll say six, nine. Six, nine for me. Jason said six, two. It's well, a I said five. Yeah, I said five. I'm, uh, there's no. Mm-mm. There's no way. It's a seven point four. Everybody. Wow. <laughs> seven point four. It's an excellent episode. Um, do we have any nams? I don't think so. Yeah. What about? The some kind of or some sort of. So I got one. I know Chris did. Let's have it. <laughs> Chris, what do you got? When Fall was describing that punishing beam, he described it as some sort of energy beam. <laughs> Excellent. Man, he really did say that. Wow, he's so... <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, get started off on the right track, please. Melissa Longo, Mm -hmm. what do you think of this amazing episode starring Jeff and Jerry Rector behind you? Uh, um, (laughs) um, Well, this episode, it wasn't as amazing as the past three episodes that we've just watched. Uh, it, I mean, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't, I don't know, the, the last three episodes have just been so phenomenal. <laughs> and I feel bad for this episode because one, it was the first time I had seen it. And two, um, yeah, it, yeah, it just, although I do have to say that I do enjoy episodes where we get the crew, um, the day-to-day life of the crew. And I do enjoy seeing how they interact with each other, especially in a crisis. Um, Like your captain is missing and they come together and are so good at their job that they know that they can trust each other and then trust that they know their captain well enough to know when he is not acting in the way that he usually does. So the chain of command is very well put well in place and they were really reluctant to, you know, mutiny, but but it was for the good of the ship, which is wonderful to know that that is what everyone's goal is in mind. um is the the good of the ship and the success of the ship and and the life of the ship as a whole so that was pretty good um i love it when we get to see a number of alien species there are so many in this 
episode. Like these mm-hmm. lovely dudes, like the dudes behind Ryan and Jason and um and Faith and everyone. But <laughs> so yeah, um I have to say that my favorite line was Picard's at the end when he said, get off my ship. <laughs> That was so fun. And I do, I really did like the the scene between Beverly and fake Picard. Um, <laughs> because I, they have chemistry. So <laughs> I, I like to see their, their little flirtings. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I have to say about this. <laughs> Seems like there's more. But okay, maybe you'll save it for later because... Way you said, that's all I have to say about that. Kind of meant like you got more to say about it. Sure. (laughs) I sure do. (laughs) Jason M. Oaken has more to say about everything, and he's going to teach us something. What do you think of this one? I always do. I mean, I did say 6.2. I personally think it's not 6.2, but I don't think it's 7.4 either. I mean, I think, as Melissa said, it it does have the misfortune of being sort of uh, sandwiched uh, among some pretty good episodes. So, you know, it suffers by comparison. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's one of the sort of uh, quieter shows, if you will. It's something mm-hmm. that has a scienti- uh, sort of a science fiction concept associated with it. Not the freshest one of all. It kind of reminded me of what the Savage Curtain did in the original series in a different way. But uh, t- for me, this episode holds together primarily uh, by Rick Colby's direction and Patrick Stewart's acting. I think to some degree it's a master class on how you uh, act little nuances where you're slightly off and you can see you're slightly off, but still good enough to pass for it. And I think, you know, uh, in, in terms of, you know, Rick Colby's work, it's just, it was just a little creepy and a little unusual. I mean, the way that cell was first of all lit and shot, I think we haven't seen, you know, we will not see as many lens flares until JJ um, Abrams is 2009. You, you don't certainly not. That's not something you see on the next gen or any of the other series of the time. But, you know, for me, frankly, uh, the, the biggest flaw of the episode is these aliens I- imitate also also well what they don't seem to understand. And that is something that I think kind of plagues this episode quite a bit. There's a lot of repetitiveness. Uh, so it kind of gets it, there's not enough story, I think, to sustain 44 minutes or 45 minutes of screen time. It certainly is entertaining. And again, uh, I think the way it looks and the way Patrick performs makes you actually want to watch this. That's it for, I guess, for the time being. And I'll save the rest for later. Just to make sure I understand what you're saying, you're saying that the aliens were able to mimic or fake Picard was able to mimic real Picard when they don't understand Picard and others, right? It's that, and also they had the bullying basically saying in the cell that, you know, keeping somebody uh, confined is mistreatment, and all of a sudden they don't understand that keeping somebody confined is mistreatment. Things like that. That's a very good point. Jason, poking holes, Oaken. All right, thank you very much for that. (laughs) Chris McGee, what do you got for us today? Well, you know how Jason sometimes mentions meat and potatoes episodes of TNG? Well, for me, this is definitely one of them. Uh, you know, when TNG was playing in syndication in the 1990s, this was the episode that was seemed to be shown the most frequently. It, I recall seeing it many times while flipping through channels back then. Um, in the introductory sequence, the sequence in that teaser, the, the brief mention of the Phylox Plague on Core Coral I-5 that was mentioned there, Captain Slog is easily overlooked, as I can attest to from my first time watching the episode, despite it being a key pot plot point later. I think it's almost a wasted opportunity to call back to a previous episode, such as the Galorndon Core incident, you know, or yeah. something similar. After all, they did mention you know, the, the primitive culture on Mintaka 3 later in the episode. So it seems like they could have done something there as well, instead of just making up something new that we don't even see. Um once you know the twist near the end of the episode, you can rewatch it with the knowledge that, you know, Haro is the imposter and see that it's almost 
obvious that she's intently observing what the others are doing throughout the episode. So I think it's just great acting uh, by the actress there to not make it so obvious if you don't know that you know, she's the imposter. But later on, if you watch it a second or third time, you can definitely see it then. So kudos to her on that. Um, as you all know, I am a fan of Ron Jones's music in the show, of course, and I would be remiss uh, if I didn't mention that the song playing during uh, Picard and Dr. Crusher's little dance is known on the Ron Jones Project album as I Only Gag When You're Near. <laughs> Naughty. As for the... Uh, Memorable quote of the episode. Well, I, you know, Melissa kind of took it, but that's all right. I have plenty of It's kind of an odd one, but what can I say? It's the one that is stuck in my brain all this time. And that is when Thal says, to forestall suspicion, you were very quick to volunteer. Mm. Mm. I also liked it when he said, uh, you probably half of your words mean fighter. And the other guy was like, all your words mean surrender or something like that. I was like, oh, these guys know how to fight. <laughs> Good arguments. Uh, Allison Leach Hyde is here. What's up, Allison? What do you think of this one? You know, I wasn't looking forward to this in the rewatch. I usually, you know, it's not one of my favorites. It's better than I remember. So that's cool. Um, it was entertaining to watch. I really liked all the interplay we got of our, our cast, you know, because we had so many scenes with with Riker and Troy and Worf and and everyone like, is the captain okay? So I really liked that we got to see them be a crew together and not just like interacting during missions. Like this ends up kind of being a mission, but so I really liked that. Um, I love the scene uh, of the clone Picard and Beverly's date. It's one of my favorites because Beverly is just trying to figure out what's going on. And she has the most beautiful draped top on that photo, you know, is so beautiful on screen sitting down. So, you know, she's just gorgeous in this. And you can just see all of her emotions on her face going, what are, what are we doing here? And then, and, and Clone Picard's so mean, like, okay, you don't want to do this? Let's dance. <laughs> Okay, then let's kiss and no, you're right. We shouldn't do this. Get out. I'm like, this is the worst date ever. <laughs> and so at the end, when when Riker and Beverly are teasing Picard, I'm like, so deserved. You weren't here for why it was deserved, but that the cherry on the top of the episode, I'd have to say for that for me. So. <laughs> Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> That's terrible. That's also known as when you wake up the next day and you're like, I'm mad at you for what you did in my dream. <laughs> That's the same energy right there. That's the We've all done it. Uh, Faith Howell, what is up, Faith? What do you think of this one? So, uh, yeah, middle of the road kind of episode for me too. Um, I did think... Um, the stated moral of the story about captivity kind of missed for me, but I did think it was an interesting commentary on trust, um, both for how, you know, it, initially the crew takes imposter Picard's um, oddities as just, you know, a, a, an average day. Sometimes weird stuff happens. It's fine. Um, and they'll follow along to a point. And then, you know, they started to sort of team up and discuss behind the scenes and they relied on each other and they trusted each other's intuition on on how he wasn't really reacting um, correctly. But also, I thought it was interesting that um, the aliens put um, their plant in a Starfleet uniform because innately the two Starfleet officers would, even though she's a cadet, would trust each other because they're on the same team. So I, I thought that was interesting as well. Though I have to say, um, how do we even trust her to begin with? What Bolian have you ever seen with that much hair? <laughs> I mean, that was obvious from the get-go. So 
I'm going to pass the torch. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, she's got a lot of hair. <laughs> well, wasn't that only the second Bolian we had seen? Mm -hmm. So at that point, maybe we just think that the ladies have hair and the the dudes played by Michael Berryman don't. Maybe. <laughs> With a wicked center part. Yep. <laughs> Everybody, that was my live in Tokyo. What is up, my? What do you think of this one? I, um, let me see. I'm gonna try and nah. I can't say it nicely. I I, I have always found you. this episode to be boring. To be honest, I, I mean, one thing I've noticed this time after the changes that I've experienced in the past decade is it must have been a very hot filming day. Um, every woman knows you do not pat finishing powder on a sweaty foundation covered face. You get blotches like like Data has on his face there. Uh, and, and, and the fake cadet has around her facial additions and, and, and you certainly dab a wet tissue on your lips to get rid of any foundation that gets, gets on there. Kind of like, like data has here. Um, you can see all of this on data. There must've been a severe lack of nominees because even though this episode was nominated for an Emmy for outstanding achievement in makeup, ay, the shockingly bad makeup on data and the cadet make this a very bad makeup day, I would say. Uh, and that and that that scene with Crusher and Picard doing test tube shots as they had faux sushi. Picard is a straight up tease, man. That was bad, bad day. Yeah, but what a tease! Holy cow. Um, but the more poignant parts of this episode were also very triggering. In rapid succession, Picard says kidnapping is a moral assault. Imprisonment is an injury, regardless of how you justify it. And now that you've had a taste of captivity, perhaps you'll reconsider the morality of inflicting it on others. If that's not triggering, given what Hamas has done to Israel for 184 days now, I don't know what is. Anyway, sort of a nothing episode for me, I got to say. Man, I'm going to be battling you guys and things left unsaid because I love this episode, I swear. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, my live in Tokyo. All right, Dr. Muhammad Noor, why did you love this episode very, very much? It was okay. <laughs> there were two there were two things that, that struck me about it. I'm not going to go into the overall assessment. It was okay. <laughs> One actually I remember from first watch. It's when the 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 big guy, the Nasca looking guy, takes a bite of that thing. He's like, poison! I was like, you just know from like the taste is, but it's not like, you know, like some people eat Brussels sprouts and say poison. It's not actually poison. So <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting that he's just like, I know this is poison. Like, okay. Nobody questioned it. Everybody just moved on. Like, okay, that's just there. <laughs> but I remember that from first watch too. The other thing that struck me was why the Picard copy wasn't perfect. And this comes back to the, the ever present question about like transporters too. If something is an absolute replicate down to the atomic level, Shouldn't it basically have just been like another Picard? Basically the same as like if Picard had transported someplace. I mean, unless you invoke a soul or something like that. I, I, I was puzzled why it was that good, but not perfect. So, I don't know. I don't know the answer. But I mean, again, the same thing happens for transport because I still think they're killing machines. So there. That's it for me. <laughs> Interesting. That's a good point. Thanks very much, Dr. Muhammad Noor. All right, Carrie Schwent, your thoughts on this one? Top 10 episode? What do you think? I very much, very much enjoy this one. Um, Patrick Stewart really gets to stretch his his muscles, you know, playing two different versions of himself. I've got, I very, very much enjoy it, and I did some some looking looking into it as my usual research, and the the wardrobe on the very large, the very large dude, who honestly looks like a combination of a Nausicaan and a Wookiee with that hair. A little mm. bit of a Wookiee. But his wardrobe was modified and reused and given to Morn on DS9. Which I think is very well reused of a very excellent wardrobe. And speaking of wardrobe, the reaction shot of Worf when the fake Picard switches to what he's supposed to look like that reaction shot was a reuse from an earlier in the season episode, and you can tell because the uniform is all baggy, and then the next shot is all smooth and straight again. And yep, yep, yep. And the food look like slices of the canned cranberries you see at Thanksgiving, but just a little paler. 
Yeah, baggy and smooth. No, I'm talking about Worf. There's a reaction oh, shot gotcha. of Worf. That one's even baggier. Now, personally, I don't, I do not enjoy the canned cranberries at Thanksgiving, but that's what those little hockey pucks look like was cranberries. And for my the poetry this week, I went into the head, head of Beverly and what she would say if she went immediately to her best friend's cabin that okay, this is this is what happened. A lovely dinner, a slow dance ends with a kiss, a sudden ending. There you have it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Carrie Schwent, a.k.a. Crafty Bear. What luck, everybody. Gregory Kenzo slides in safe. Uh, no, there's Boy. no time reference there, but thank you very much for hopping in for <laughs> us, Greg Kenzo. What did you think of this particular episode? I, I like this one. Uh, I want to say sorry to everybody for being late. I uh, I saw my bed looking really comfortable, and then I was like, hey, I'm just going to lay down for a second, and then boom, I'm 30 <laughs> minutes late. Um, yeah. Uh, this this was a good episode. Uh, some parts. Uh, there were... I don't know what the consensus was before this. Um, I might be like talking... Um, I might be talking out of turn here, but yeah, I think this was decent. It gave me, um, I think invasion of the body snatcher vibes, um, Picard, even though like all of his actions seem like you would like that out of him. People are like, Oh, why is, why is Picard? So like angry all the time in all the other episodes when he's finally jolly, you're like, okay, this isn't. You know, I don't like I don't like that. Stop that. Um, you know, uh, I thought this was uh, I mean, this was pretty obvious. It was commenting on authority and the trust um, inherent in that. Um, you know, the I, right away, it felt like Picard, uh, the bully and, and the other two that felt like a microcosm of the Federation. It was like. Okay, here you have two species that don't get along, and then you have a captain and a uh, his officer. You know, um, so yeah, it felt like there were. It really, it just felt exactly like there were like rats in a in a maze. In a, in a, yeah, and they say that later, and I was like, okay, well, thank you for saying that. Thank you for it. But yeah, so this was this was good. Mm -hmm. I know that. I couldn't like. It doesn't sound heart heartfelt, but yeah, I'm. It's like uh, I there. I know there's better episodes of TNGs, coming up, so I'm excited for that. Greg, would you believe that before you showed up, everybody crapped on this episode so rudely, except for Carrie, she's legit. <laughs> but you want <won> <laughs> that was very hurtful. By the way. <laughs> Here's the uh, canned cranberry thing. I thought it looked like one of those <laughs> old soaps. Remember how when you go visit somebody's house or grandma's yeah. house, and they would have like that soap? Yeah. It looks like, like a urinal cake. Urinal cakes. Too. Urino Urino cakes. Urino. Yeah. 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 <laughs> They're not cake, believe me. So, All right, everybody. Uh, we got to. Just in time. Perfect. You don't want to know. We got to get Brian, out of here. We don't want to know that. Jake's <laughs> final take will be mailed to everybody separately. <laughs> uh, so everybody in the comments below, leave us your postage and uh, mm. like a self. No, you can't do that on self the address stamped envelope. Yeah, you can't do that. Just, That's just nice. the address in the comments. Thanks. All right, <laughs> Greg Kenzo, thank you very much. Carrie, Muhammad, my Faith, Allison, Chris, Jason, Melissa, for myself, for Sirach Lofton, watching an amazing basketball game. His daughter is hopefully winning for the championship. For Mr. Aaron Eisenberg, thank you all very much for hanging out with us. We will see you next time. And until then, always remember the seventh rule.